The following podcast is an audio recording taken from National Public Radio Chicago on October 2nd, 2012. This is Worldview on WBEZ. I'm Jerome McDonald. It's been 19 months since the massive earthquake and tsunami off the coast of Japan caused a nuclear meltdown at the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. Since then, the Japanese government worked to secure the plant's destroyed reactors and has begun a cleanup process it expects to take decades. Meanwhile, government officials have struggled to find a balance between the nation's dependence on nuclear energy, which generates 30% of Japan's electricity, and the public's well-founded fear of another catastrophic meltdown. With me now to give us an update on the aftermath of Fukushima is Arnie Gunderson. He's co-founder of the Fairwinds Energy Education. It's a nonprofit that educates the public on nuclear energy issues. He's a former nuclear industry executive turned whistleblower whose assessment of the country's uh, nuclear situation has gained popular support in Japan. Welcome, Arnie Gunderson. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, First of all, the reactors themselves. I think everybody knows that uh, you know complete instantaneous cleanup is not going to happen. But what kind of state are they in? Can we walk through them? You know, a lot of people think that when a nuclear reactor shuts down, um, that's the end of it. And um, uh, immediately after the earthquake, the nuclear control rods shot into this reactor and stopped the chain reaction. But the nuclear fuel remains physically hot for five years it's, it's, and radioactively hot for, for decades. So what's happening now is that the, the plants remain highly contaminated, but also there's still a lot of decay heat. Uh, just yesterday, Unit 1 saw a temperature increase of uh, about 18 degrees uh, because of a, a cooling system um, uh, problem. So they have to be cooled even though they're... A you know, officially shut down. Uh, all four reactors are highly contaminated, and almost all the work is being done remotely. They have huge construction cranes that, with no operator in them, they're uh, they're being done, you know, by wire in a, in a building removed from the site. All right. So, it, like at this unit one, when it goes up 18 degrees yesterday, they they whip the crane around and uh, do something. Unit 1's been the, the, the most interesting as far as keeping it cool. And they, they think what's happening is that some sort of uh, biological fouling is occurring. The pipes are, are getting organisms growing inside them, and it's plugging the cooling flow into the nuclear reactor. Um, you know, it, it's still about um, 80 degrees centigrade or about 170 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not yet boiling, but... Um, if if the problem doesn't get resolved again, even though it's 18, uh, 18 months after the accident, uh, these reactors can uh, begin to boil again. In, and the ultimate solution for something like Unit 1 is is what? You wait till um, it cools down and then... You know, I, I had, uh, I've changed my mind on that over the last year. Um, they have to physically cool it for about five years, after which it will be cool enough that they don't have to run these these cooling pumps. Um, and I had thought that after five years they could um, begin a very expensive um, uh, but laborious uh, decontamination and dismantlement. In the last 18 months, though, I've, I've, I've changed my mind, and the plants are highly radioactive. And the question is, do you want to expose thousands and thousands of workers to high levels of radiation or would it be better to just mothball these plants and uh, and come back in a hundred years? Um, either way, it's it's something on the order of a hundred billion dollars just on site. Forget cleaning up Fukushima Prefecture, but the four units on site that are um, that blew up um, are going to cost around um, you know seventy to a hundred billion dollars. And the question is, do you spend it now and risk high exposures to people? Um, for what gain, or do you, you know, entomb these plants with concrete, and uh, and come back in a hundred years? That's a question the Japanese have yet to answer. What would you do? Um, I would entomb them and come back later. You know, the the um, 
why would you want to dismantle them? There's, certainly there's the visual impact and the embarrassment and, and things like that. But, uh, but to my mind now, you know, the, the lives of the people going to clean up and the potential for cancers uh, outweighs that. And I would do basically what we've done at uh, Chernobyl, which is to uh, put a sarcophagus around it, uh, you know, basically fill them with concrete. I would also then bore under the plants and continually withdraw the groundwater. Uh, because there's still going to be seepage of radioactive material into the ocean and into the groundwater and keep that from seeping out into the environment. But uh, I, I just can't justify in my own mind, you know, exposing, you know, tens of thousands of Japanese workers to high levels of radiation for just the physical effect of um, of cleaning this plant up. Um, we were largely talking about Unit 1 there, but there's these other units, and they present different challenges that uh, do they all lend themselves to uh, a bucket of cement eventually? Well, Unit 4 is the, uh, is the most pressing, and it actually has been since the first, um, the first day of the accident. Um, just to put your listeners into perspective, as you're looking at the plant from the ocean, the plant on the right is unit one, then two, then three. So the furthest one on the left is unit four. Unit four has no nuclear fuel in the reactor. It's all in the spent fuel pool. And it's the reason that the Americans were warned to evacuate out to 50 miles. It wasn't the explosions in one, two, and three. It was the fear of um, of a fuel pool fire in unit four. And that fear still exists. That plant is still uh, as bad as it was on the on the day of the tsunami. Structurally, it's been damaged by the earthquake, and then it also had a series of explosions. So it's not as rigid as it was, but you know, back on the back before the uh, the earthquake on March 10th, for instance, of 2011. So um, they have to get that fuel out of that fuel pool just as quickly as possible. Um, if um, if everything goes well and there's no earthquake. Um, everything will be fine. And uh, over a period of about, the Japanese want to take five years to uh, gradually pull the fuel from the fuel pool, store it on the ground, and then uh, and then uh, dismantle the building because it's the cleanest. But the, the fear in the scientific community is that if there is a large earthquake again, the pool could rupture. When that happens, the fuel gets very hot because it's fresh. It came from the nuclear reactor 18 months ago, and in, in, within a day or two, it can begin to burn in air. Uh, there's a video out on from Sandia National Labs that shows nuclear fuel burning. If that happens, we're right back to, to the first day of the accident. You have um, an enormous amount of radiation, the equivalent of 700 nuclear bombs worth of um, cesium that could be released into the environment. So... Uh, th this is one of those low probability but high consequence events that that, that plague the uh, nuclear power in general and especially the Daiichi site. The um, so Unit Four, the Japanese have come up with a plan to um, basically build a new building on top of the one that is destroyed, and, um, um, and begin a process of gradually removing the nuclear fuel. I don't think it's aggressive enough. When I was in Tokyo two weeks ago, I got to question the Japanese, and they admitted that there are other alternatives, but uh, they're sort of fixated on um, on a, a very slow alternative. And, uh, of course, if, if um, an earthquake doesn't occur, they're right. But uh, I hate to gamble on the fact, uh, given the, the rapid increase in earthquake frequency in Japan over the last 18 months. All right. So, um, But they're getting the water, I think, on it on a regular basis, this uh, spent uh, pool, uh, fuel yes. pool. That it, it's, um, we, I think people remember from the accident, people were spraying water on it and things like that, but now they can they have a consistent source of water and they're able to uh, move it around in a good fashion. Well, y yes, they have pumps and, and, um, and, and pipes that they pull the water um, out from the basements and pump it back into the fuel pools to keep it cool. Um, it's not nuclear grade back uh, two months ago both of their cooling pumps failed within a day of each other and the pool began to heat up at about uh, uh, 18 degrees a day so had that continued for about five or six days it would have begun to boil but 
uh, Tokyo Electric had had enough time to repair both damaged pumps and um, and begin the cooling process. Um, I think if um, uh, there's I can't come up with a scenario that uh, they couldn't fix the pumps in time if there was a pipe break. The big fear is if it's worse than that. If the pool were to crack, that's that, that's game over. Um, the 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 water would leave the pool. And spraying water with a fire hose is not adequate to keep the pool from uh, keep the fuel from catching fire. All right, um, it's interesting to think about something like that. I don't think most people think about a, a burning uh, nuclear fire in the air. That's that's a possibility. What happens is the nuclear fuel is clad with something called um, zirconium, and zirconium um, reacts with oxygen and makes zirconium oxide. Uh, when when something reacts with oxygen, we call that burning. Um, water also has oxygen in it, so if you if the zirconium gets hot over two thousand degrees, um, and you put water on it, it doesn't put the fire out. It actually makes the fire worse because the zirconium strips out the oxygen from the water, and continues to burn. It's called pyrophoric, so that. Um, um, this this cladding that's on top of the nuclear fuel, um, if it hits 2,000 degrees, that, and of course that would mean the absence of water, but if it hits 2,000 degrees, it begins to burn in air. And um, as I said, San, it, it was interesting. Uh, Sandia National Labs did this test on uh, two, two weeks before the Fukushima Daiichi accident. They simulated a uh, nuclear fuel rod with uh, electric heaters instead of Instead of the nuclear heat coming out of the decay of nuclear products, they made a simulation. And it, it clearly shows the, the rod burning in air. Um, now, have you gone to Japan and talked about uh, this possibility? And uh, what do industry executives and people in Japan think about this? Um, yeah, I have to give a shout-out to my wife, Maggie, who's the actual founder of Fairwinds. I'm the, I'm the chief engineer. <laughs> Uh, I was in Japan for uh, 10 days uh, earlier in September, and I was there for seven days back in February. Um, and uh, w there was a scientific symposium I was part of at uh, uh, Tokyo University. Um, there are an enormous number of unknowns that um, um, it's going to take years to sort out. Um, what caused these units to explode? Um, Unit 1's uh, explosion is entirely different than Unit 3's. Was there seismic damage? Uh, there's a lot of indications that Unit 1 had actually begun to fail before the tsunami hit. And that's troubling for the nuclear industry in general because that could indicate that the, uh, the codes that we design these plants to are, um, are, are inadequate. Um, so there's a, a, a large number of concerns related to how we've constructed these plants, and in retrospect, are they are they strong enough? In Japan, uh, particularly, people are beginning to question the, the the why did we build so many plants on the most seismically active piece of real estate on the planet? Um, you can't go but a mile from any one of these plants and find a, an active earthquake fault. So um, uh, that's a grave concern, and of course, then what do you do with nuclear fuel as spent fuel at the end of the cycle? Uh, is there a place on Japan where you could possibly store the spent fuel for a quarter of a million years, given its high seismicity? So there's a lot of questions in the scientific community in Japan about the wisdom of going forward with nuclear power. Yeah, I was reading uh, in the news that Japan, you know, with all this to and fro over what role nuclear is going to play in the future, they want to move ahead with their testing of fast breeder reactors, and a lot of people see fast breeder reactors as the way to get rid of your uh, spent nuclear fuel as it is, and they're still doing that. They have one uh, reactor called the Manju reactor, which uh, started up 15 years ago and has run for three months since then. It uh, constantly has fires and and mechanical problems they you have to use liquid sodium uh, they have decided to go forward and try again with the manju reactor even though it's very near uh, an earthquake fault you know that the the japanese uh, claimed to make a decision uh, that, that they would be uh, uh, no longer operating their nuclear plants in uh, sometime between 2030 and 2040 
But behind the scenes, I don't see that happening. Uh, the, the the example you just brought up with uh, why would you be building a fast breeder reactor if you uh, had planned to shut all your nuclear plants down in ten in ten or twenty years? Also, the Japanese are uh, continuing to build a reprocessing facility, um, and whether or not that works is is a, a second question. But the bigger question is there's enough fuel in Japan right now that they don't need reprocessing unless they plan to run for a hundred years. So I think they, what they're telling their population in an election season is that we've made the decision to shut our nuclear plants down in 20 or 30 years. And, uh, but, but behind the scenes, most of the indications are that they really have no, no intention of, um, of shutting their nuclear program down. We were talking before the break about uh, what Japan's government is thinking now, and they've announced that they're going to phase out nuclear power by the end of the 2030s. And this is a this is a pretty long deadline. And for people who've been watching uh, Germany go through the same kind of uh, conversation, they they've put several years out there and gone back and forth and. Uh, they're trying to decommission the old ones, and it's a kind of a trick to de-entangle yourself from all these different reactors and all these different investments that people have made, and um, I guess that's what Japan's wrestling with now. Yeah, you're right. There's, there is a big difference between the uh, the, the German commitment and the... Uh, um, the, the lip service we're seeing out of the Japanese government. You know, the um, the Germans had uh, a couple reactors like the Fukushima Daiichi reactors. And by the way, America has uh, has has uh, 23 reactors identical to Fukushima. But anyway, the Germans seem to um, uh, have a, a political agreement with their people and with their industry. I think the Germans view this as an opportunity to uh, to create a new technology, a smart grid with renewables and a combination of windmills and, and solar and and um, and other things. So, but industry bought in in Germany, and I don't see that in Japan. When I was in Japan, um, there were very few people who really wanted nuclear. You know, they were they were terrorized. They had. That they had seen in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, and, and their national psyche uh, was fragile, but they committed to nuclear, and now they've got Fukushima and Daiichi. So that um, I think the national will at the within the population has been destroyed to move forward. But the industry in Japan has not made that transition like the Japanese, uh, like the German industry has. Uh, they haven't bought in, and in fact have heavily lobbied the Japanese government to continue with their nuclear program. There's a story out on the wires today also that the um, uh, the American administration, uh, the, as high as President Obama, but certainly Hillary Clinton as well, lobbied the Japanese not to give up on nuclear power in the last month. So there was intensive pressure from the Americans as well as from the Japanese business interests to sort of create this fuzzy deadline that's so far down the road that really nobody has to do anything right now. Well, why does the U.S. want Japan to stay nuclear? Um, you know, we have a very uh, pro-nuclear policy in the United States. Uh, you know, President Obama, of course, was you know from Illinois, and the biggest um, you know the the biggest early money in his com campaign came from Exelon. So he's been heavily influenced by by pro-nuclear um, lobbyists for the entire administration. Um, it's an export commodity, but according to the, the the press reports that are out there today, it's more than that. It was a fear that 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 it would become a contagion, if you will. If the Germans could eliminate nuclear and the Japanese could eliminate nuclear, the fear was that, you know, why why can't that happen in America too? So the pressure was on the Japanese to stop the contagion and, and basically just say, well, the Germans are on their own little, um, singing their own little tune, but the rest of the world is still pro-nuclear. All right. And now, um, if the Japanese industry is still really... Um, bought into this. Um, what's different about Japanese industry than, than German industry or than um, U.S. nuclear industry? Well, the Germans um, have some very heavy industry that's already geared to renewables. 
So I think they already saw the the business opportunity for um, uh, replacing these nuclear plants. They had a, they, they stood a, a real good chance of making making some money. Uh, but the Germans also have a, 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 a I think more of a um, uh, more assertive export policy, and um, the 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 Germans saw the opportunity if they get it right in Germany, and they can uh, get a grid that communicate so where the wind is blowing in one part not in the other the power can be transferred if they can figure that out for germany they could sell it worldwide um and and i don't think the japanese really acknowledged that they had that opportunity too that was one of the things i talked about extensively when i was in japan that there's um uh, first off your island is so high highly seismic why are you moving forward with the given the risk but but secondly, there's a chance to make some money here. Um, the the people of Japan understand the risk, but the businesses of Japan just don't seem to have internalized the uh, uh, the opportunity side of the of the crisis. Now, um, you published a book in Japan about the crisis, and it was only published in Japan, and you, you sold quite a few copies. Um, what is it about what you're saying to Japanese people that, that is appealing to them? Well, I was one of the first people who told them, uh, who told them the truth. You know, I was on CNN the fifth day of the accident saying that this accident was as bad as Chernobyl. It was a level seven while their own government was saying it wasn't even as bad as Three Mile Island and this was a level four, and Secretary Chu was saying it was a level five. So um, I was telling them all along that they should evacuate the women and children and things like that. So for some reason, I've become a trusted, a trusted Westerner. The book sold 30,000 copies and was number one on Amazon Science, not, not Amazon you know, the, uh, the with the diet books and the celebrity books, right. but in the science section for about four months. I think they, um, between that and the Fairwinds website, which is heavily watched by the Japanese, I've developed the trust with the Japanese over the last 18 months. And, uh, and frankly, also a deep respect. I have a deep respect for what they're going through. There's um, a thousand people on those two sites, Daiichi and Daini, save the world. It wasn't technology that saved the world. A thousand men working in, in awful conditions uh, pulled those plants back from the brink and prevented Japan from being cut in half. And so, you know, I'm trying to honor the, their sacrifice while at the same time presenting, you know, a factual basis to move forward. Do you think uh, the Japanese people have a pretty good grip now on what is going to happen to them in the years to come, that there are going to be health risks and there are going to be um, places they can't go and hot spots? I mean, there's going to be food issues for a while. Um, there's a major schism in the, in the society. The, the women um, understand that. Um, a large fraction of the men uh, want to believe that the authorities are taking care of them and there is no and there is no risk and uh, that's new to Japanese society you know we're seeing uh, back back in September when I was there um, hundreds of thousands of people would surround the uh, the president's um, uh, home in downtown Tokyo every Friday evening in a peaceful demonstration Japan hasn't seen hundreds of thousands of people demonstrate for anything since uh, at least from 1970. So there's a, there's an anger underneath the veneer of um, uh, of calm, and the anger is really being driven by women, uh, much more so than men. All right, very interesting. And are the health concerns that people face in the future is there a realistic attitude towards that? No, the the uh, the nuclear industry is saying that there'll be about a hundred cancers as a result of these four nuclear accidents, and and frankly, uh, you know, I've I've said and my analysis shows that it'll be closer to a million. So, uh, the the same people they trusted back before the accident are telling them now. Well, first, they told them an accident couldn't happen, and now they're telling them that uh, the consequences are are minimal. And there's a, a great distrust for both Tokyo Electric 
and uh, NISA, the regulator, the equivalent of our Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Um, they simply don't trust their authorities and, uh, uh, and are looking elsewhere for, uh, for scientific information. Well, why would you think a million people would get cancer? You know, I got that number um, from uh, going back over the records on Three Mile Island in Chernobyl and um, and did some ratios. Uh, of course, um, this this accident released something on the order of 100 to 1,000 times more radiation than uh, than TMI and, uh, and, and um, comparable levels, perhaps three times more noble gases than Chernobyl and perhaps a little bit less cesium than Chernobyl, but, but comparable, coupled with the fact that it's a higher population density in Japan than, I, than at either site. There's some epidemiological data out of uh, TMI that shows a uh, statistically meaningful 20% increase in lung cancer um, in the five years after the accident by Dr. Stephen Wing down in uh, North Carolina. So the, the using that evidence and, and ratioing for the amount uh, that was released in the population density, um, I'm coming up with something on the order of a million cancers. We're seeing that already. Um, there was 4,000 kids were tested just in the last couple months, and almost half of them had thyroid nodules. Now, normally, um, about 1 or 2% of kids would have thyroid nodules. So we're seeing an enormous increase on a cancer precursor um, for thyroid cancers in a, popu in a sample size of about 4,000 kids. So um, I'm also seeing um, samples from indoor um, uh, dust. We're getting people sending us vacuum cleaner bags. And uh, the indoor dust in these homes is astronomical. One, one bag that was tested over in Europe came back with 100,000 disintegrations every second in a two-pound vacuum cleaner bag. So that's on the floors in their home, and of course the Japanese sleep on the floor and and and, and essentially live on the floor for, um, you know, where they sit on the floor and things like that. So internal contamination in Japan um, will be a significant factor, and neither the Japanese government nor the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency has taken that into account when they do their numbers. And um, the food situation, I mean, there were huge scares in Japan. How would you describe it now? It's gradually washing its way out of the rice, and probably in a, a year or two or three, um, it will be completely gone. But where it's going now is into the water. So, you know, you're seeing it wash out of the mountains and, uh, and, and uh, into the fresh water, into reservoirs, and we're seeing uh, freshwater fish and, uh, and saltwater fish as far away as um, 300 kilometers, 200 miles, uh, with very high levels of cesium uh, in, in, their, in their meat. Um, the Japanese government is uh, beginning to allow a couple selective species of fish caught within a couple hundred miles to be, uh, to be eaten. Um, and I'm not convinced their testing is adequate, but at least there's uh, some limitations on what the population is eating in terms of fish. All right, we've got just a couple minutes left, but um, the U.S. did have uh, some kind of reckoning about nuclear power after this. They had some reports and some thinking was done. Um, what do you think the U.S. reaction you know, has been and should have been? Well, the U.S. reaction has basically been to keep every reactor running. Our reaction after Three Mile Island was different. We, we shut down the six nuclear plants that were identical to Three Mile Island. Uh, here we have 23 nuclear plants that are identical to Fukushima Daiichi, and, and, and we didn't do that. Um, I think we're missing the big point. The, the, the big point is this, uh, that when a nuclear plant doesn't get cooling, uh, it will melt down no matter what, what you do. We call that loss of the ultimate heat sink. And it's not about a tsunami, and it's not about an earthquake, which is what the nuclear industry seems to focus on. There's pumps along the river, uh, and if those pumps are destroyed by an act of Mother Nature or by an act of a terrorist, uh, we would have Fukushima Daiichi in our own backyards. So I think that, um, and that issue, this thing called loss of the ultimate heat sink, the inability to cool a nuclear reactor after it shuts down, the NRC is considering looking at that, oh, perhaps you know, five to ten years from now is when they'll begin 
to uh, to look at it. I think it needs to be looked at right now, and um, uh, I, I, I sort of feel like a voice in the wilderness on that. But I do understand that uh, certainly I have supporters within the NRC who feel that way also. Ernie Gunderson is a former nuclear industry executive turned whistleblower. He is uh, with the Fairwinds Energy Education Group now. It's a nonprofit that educates the public on nuclear energy issues. Uh, it has a website for you to check out. We'll put a link to it on our website.